Minnesota right now, and they have two dogs. I love dogs. And he has two daughters, and he's right behind you guys, so he's about to talk. Thank you, Haley. I think this works. So Haley just did my whole stump speech for me. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Haley. And thanks to all of you for being here. Um, if nothing else, I can tell you that after a career in the whiskey business, the ice cream business, and the coffee business, I surely do know what Americans need more of. So good, good to be with all of you. And not only do well, I love Keene State, I love it so much that our whole slogan is Keen on Dean. So uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, sincerely, to those of you who took the time to come here today and spend a little time with me, uh, you are the saviors of democracy. I mean it. Uh, New Hampshire has a beautiful tradition of doing just this. Uh, we come here and we subject ourselves to your questions and your comments and your criticisms, and you do it beautifully. And I want to thank you for that. Uh, both Keene State, all of the colleges and universities in the state uh, make an effort, of course, to have a, a political department that holds us accountable. And to those of you uh, who come out and participate, I just want to thank you because we do have a crisis of participation. Uh, I want to talk about that today. Um, you know, Haley covered a lot of my bio, but I'll tell you my story and how I got to Congress and why I am doing this today. And then I want to hear from you. Uh, there's no question off limits. I get in trouble regularly for telling the truth and answering questions, which I think everybody should do a little bit more of. Um, my life did start by losing my father uh, when I was just six months old. My dad, Artie, grew up very poor in St. Paul, Minnesota. My grandfather died, uh, Victor, when he was very young. My grandma, Ruth, worked at a department store to try to make ends meet for my uncle and my dad. Uh, my father could not afford college. I'm sure some of you in this room understand that. And he earned an ROTC scholarship to attend the University of Minnesota Law School, was sent to Vietnam just a few months before I was born, in 1968. He was killed in Pleiku, Vietnam, in a helicopter crash um, just a few days after the moon landing. And I do think regularly about him looking up at the moon and seeing America at its very, very best, and looking down at his boots in Vietnam and seeing us at our very worst. And that is, to me, the same choice we make today is what America do we want to be, the one that looks to the moon and pursues it, or the one that often is looking at military boots on the ground all around the world. Uh, when he died, I was six months old. My mom was just 24 and widowed. Uh, we lived with my great-grandparents uh, for the first three years of my life uh, in a stroke of great good fortune uh, and good luck. I was adopted by an amazing dad into a remarkable family. Uh, my grandmother became Dear Abby, my aunt Ann Landers, I had a lot of advice in my household, you can imagine. Uh, and I got lucky. And in no small part, that's what illuminates my work to this very day. Uh, when a, an event like happened to me, an event of good fortune and tragedy, um, forced me to look on living life and on both sides of advantage. And when you get lucky like I did, it's a responsibility. It's incumbent on people like me to try to share that opportunity with others. Because there are a lot of kids from the Vietnam War who lost their dads, uh, kids that lost their moms and dads in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, who will not be as lucky as me. And I know that, and I'm trying to do something about it. Um, I grew up very fortunate. I went to Brown University. I joined a startup company when I graduated college. I uh, joined our family business, um, built Belvedere Vodka, and then, of course, moved into the ice cream business and built Talenti Gelato. Had just opened some coffee shops in 2015, and we were watching the election in 2016, my family and me. I had a nice life, and never imagined that our lives in this country, and frankly, the world, would change so dramatically that evening. And I woke up the next morning, the first thing I heard was my daughter, 16 years old, crying in her bedroom. She had just overcome Hodgkin's lymphoma, which was a traumatic experience, as you can imagine, for her, of course, and for our family. And she's a gay woman. I did not know that at the time. But I could tell that there was a fear in her eyes that I'd never seen before. And we FaceTimed my elder daughter, who was a freshman in college. And sitting at the breakfast table that morning, I promised my daughters that I would do something because I'd raise them to be participants, not just observers. And I think we, when I say we have a crisis of participation right now, we cannot take this for granted. I have for far too long. I thought we were in good hands with good people doing the right thing by all of us. Sadly, I've discovered that is not the case. And when I promised them I would do something, I endeavored to win a seat in Congress. And I faced people, I asked friends, and they all said the same thing. You know, you're out of your mind, you're going to lose, and you will torpedo your career. So I did it. And we flipped a district in Minnesota that had been in Republican hands since the 1958 election. And I beat a man, an incumbent Republican, who had won by 14 points that night in 2016. We won by 12. And I mean it, we won by 12, not I. 
because this doesn't just take one person. Anybody who says they did it alone, we all know the truth, and that's why I'm here in front of you today. Uh, we won by 12, won by 12 again, and then last uh, election won by almost 20. And when I got to Congress, I thought, you know what, I'm going to be with this remarkable group of young Americans, older Americans from all uh, parts of the country, all kinds of politics, and Nancy Pelosi and Kevin McCarthy would push us together, get us to know each other, right, work together, educate us, uh, afford us some time to learn our way around and understand how the system works. My goodness, you guys, it was just the opposite, just the opposite. Uh, systemic separation starts on day one in the United States Congress, and it is appalling. What I discovered right away is they don't want us to get to know each other. They do not want us to have any time. They want all of our time spent raising money. 10,000 hours per week is how much members of Congress spend collectively pursuing money. And they also didn't want to educate us and provide us that opportunity to learn about how to do things. You know why? Because they don't want us challenging the power structure. That is how our entire two-party system is working right now. The incentives are completely perverse, completely misaligned, and we're in trouble. And George Washington, of all people, warned us about this in his farewell address over 200 years ago. He talked about factions. We didn't have parties at the time. We did not have political parties. He warned us that factions would undermine this very extraordinary experiment in democracy. And I believe they have. And I'm willing to talk about that uh, with all of you uh, today. So I endeavored to try to do it differently. Uh, my wife and I host bipartisan dinners. I join the Problem Solvers Caucus to uh, sit down with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. We're 32 Democrats, 32 Republicans. Now, you don't know our names because the media doesn't want people who are kind and, and respectful and decent, right? The best way to become famous in politics is just to be an unmitigated jerk. And we got a lot of those people right now. So we are the workhorses, not the show horses. So I'm partially on a mission to demonstrate that we can do better by actually putting people of better capacity and competency and decency in the very seats of power uh, that I think we all uh, would like to see more of. And then I joined the Modernization Committee because I wanted to fix that bad physical design and social design and organizational design of Congress, all totally fixable. But when you have, most, when you have a place mostly populated with people who have spent their whole careers in public service, and I respect that, you don't have people that have outside experiences from organizational design, institutional design, management. It's so fixable. But again, the power structures prevent us from doing that. And then this last Congress, I endeavored to join the House leadership team. So I offered myself as a candidate, and my colleagues elected me as one of the 10 leaders of the U.S., the Democratic House Caucus in the U.S. Congress. And there I sat, trying to market Bidenomics and trying to promote the president's agenda, which I voted for, because I think it's good stuff. It doesn't, uh, it's not everything we need to do, and we've got to do a whole lot more. But what really started troubling me is when I was a member of Congress when Donald Trump was president, uh, all of us Democrats were really upset with our colleagues who would say one thing quietly and privately, and then something totally different publicly. When I say a good 90% of my Republican colleagues found Donald Trump to be dangerous and offensive, I bet the number's even higher than that. But then they'd get in front of the cameras and say something totally different because they're fearful, and they know if they're running for election again, they cannot say one word that might undermine their next election. And I thought that was a disease that was unique to the right. And lo and behold, my friends, it is a disease just as contagious to the left. And what I found is that as the president's standing with the country eroded, his approval numbers started dropping, the polls started to show, as, as recently as six months ago, that he was likely to lose the next election to Donald Trump. Uh, I became very concerned and started having those same conversations with my colleagues that the Republicans were having amongst themselves about Donald Trump. Now, the, the two men are not even close to the same. One is a man of integrity and decency and competency, and I really respect Joe Biden. The other man is a dangerous person. I saw it face to face in the White House, in the Situation Room with him, because I don't make judgments about people until I sit with them. But what became clear is that that disease was contagious and that I was not finding any of my colleagues courageous enough to just say it out loud. And I thought, you know what, it's time to say the quiet part out loud. He's not going to win the next election, I'm afraid. And the country is saying he's too old. The country is saying they want to turn the page. The country is saying 70-some percent do not want either of these men as the leading candidates. That's just what the numbers are saying. And they would talk about it with me quietly, but then get on the front of the cameras and say something totally different. So I resigned from House leadership because I was really appalled, and I saw the danger of what is now starting to permeate politics 
on both sides of the aisle. And that's why I'm here, because it's a time for courage. I have torpedoed my career in Congress. And that's okay, because what we're facing right now is a culture in which nobody is willing to torpedo their career, and I'm afraid the country will be torpedoed because of it. And you will see, if you look at it really closely, everybody who wishes to run again and uh, be reelected in Congress, or in the White House, will say and do just about anything it takes to hold their position within the two parties. And that's just the truth. The people who you see act a little bit more courageously are typically the ones who are not running again. And you can look through history and that's always the truth. And that's why I'm here in front of you. So the quiet part out loud is this. President Biden is likely to lose to Donald Trump. That's the truth. That's what the numbers are saying. The other quiet part out loud is our country is facing a crisis of affordability. And I have to tell you, I've tried my best in my lifetime to spend time with people who see things differently, who are living differently, who are experiencing traumas and challenges that are probably very foreign to people who grow up in homes of privilege and have created success. But I tell you, I've been in Washington now five and a half years, and the encapsulation of Washington, D.C., especially in the White House, the inability to, to connect with people who are struggling because you're spending 10,000 hours per week, per week raising money, you're raising it from people who have a lot of it. And the more time you spend with people who have a lot of it, you become convinced that the problems facing the nation are the problems facing the wealthy. And that's true on the right and the left. What I've discovered is as I get out and spend so much more time with extraordinary courageous Americans all throughout the country, particularly right here in New Hampshire, is that is so woefully disconnected from the truth. People are really suffering. Housing, if you can find it, is not affordable. Homelessness, my goodness. I knew it's true in San Francisco and Los Angeles and Chicago and New York. It's horrifying. But when I walk around Veterans Park in Manchester and see men sleeping outside, even in this weather, I think some of whom are veterans, for goodness sakes, this is true in every village and town and city in America. It's not unique to just the big cities. Health care. Did you know that the most common cause of bankruptcies in the United States of America, almost two-thirds of them, are from medical debt in the United States of America? Do you know that education, do you know how much, you probably know this, especially students in this room, $1.7 trillion in student debt right now in the United States. Interest rates are rising. It's going to be, it, it's already unaffordable. And interest rates are going to go up even more. But even at 5%, that's like $85 billion a year just in interest payments. So housing and homelessness and health care it's just an education and groceries. Life is unaffordable, and that's why I'm here in front of you. The quiet part is life is unaffordable, and that's what I'm saying out loud, much to the dismay of my colleagues in Washington and much to the dismay of the president who is trying to convince the country right now that everything's okay, and it's not. And when I say torpedo one's career, I came from a nice life before this. God willing, I'll have a nice one after this. I'm not running for re-election, I'm not trying to become a senator, I'm not trying to become a governor, and I'm not trying to become president in 2028. And you know why? Because I'm convinced if Donald Trump is elected again, we will not have a 2028 election that looks anything like we've ever seen in America before. So when I called people whose names you know better than mine right now, Gretchen Whitmer, J.B. Pritzker, when I literally called them, when I made a public call to better known Democrats, to join the stage, the water's warm, jump in, this is democracy. They refused to do it. Nobody would even talk to me because they didn't want to offend the president. And furthermore, my simple message to them was, 2028 is not meeting the moment. The country needs you now. And I think the, I think the president's a good man, but I think he's doing this country a terrible injustice by running again. And I think he will lose to Donald Trump and that will be his legacy. Not a legacy of saving the country, and passing wonderful legislation, but a legacy of being the wrong person this time where he was the right person last time. So with that, I just want to say thank you, because participation is why we are actually failing. It is why both parties do not want to see you vote in the primary. In fact, my party, my party didn't even want you to have a primary. My party in Florida this week decided they would not have a presidential primary either. Two states, the Democratic Party, the party I love, the party that I've been supporting and enabling my whole life. 
the party that my grandmother, Dear Abby, sat at a dinner table in 1980 and pointed to me and said, what are you, a Democrat or Republican? I said, I did not know. She said, you're a Democrat. <laughs> that was her first bit of advice. But I say this sincerely, my friends. The destruction of democracy is not unique to the right. It is happening in front of our eyes right here in your state, and it's happening in Florida right now. And I'm on a mission now to do two things to become president of the United States, to change this incredibly destructive system right now. And I'm also now on a mission to expose the truth about what is happening in our politics, in what should be the most transparent, supportive, competitive democracy in the entire world. But what do we have? We have coronations, not competitions. So I would ask for your support. I would ask for your great questions. I would ask for your criticisms. But most of all, no matter who you vote for, please vote in the primary. Because if you notice, and I'm going to end with this, if you notice, both parties, they would put all their effort behind getting out the vote in the general election. You've gotten those calls. You've seen the canvassers and the get out the vote messages, right? When's the last time you saw them do that in primaries? They don't want you to. They don't want you to vote in primaries because that would hand the keys to all of us to actually elevate candidates who represent the overwhelming majority of the country. And that is why, my friends, that we are constantly subject to candidates like we are being subject to right now if we don't make the choice to change it. That's why 70% of the country is saying they want someone different than Joe Biden or Donald Trump. Yet, estimates are that maybe 14% of the country will get out and vote on primary day. So if I have a challenge to all of you, please have the courage to get up, take the time and go vote in the primary, and take the power back and bring it back to the people that deserve it. So thank you for spending your time with me. I want to hear your questions, and I will not leave, no matter what my staff says, until I answer every single one of them. Thanks, everybody. So who's going to start it out? Yes, ma'am, and then I'll come to you. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes, you, 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 you. <laughs> All right, let's see if we can get strong here. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Um, considering, like what you said about affordability and everything, listen very strongly to you. Um, four of us here are all on, are close to Social Security. And reading in the paper, we are seeing that in the year um, 2034, we could be required, or not required, we just won't get 24% of our Social Security money. It will just stop. And even though the four of us are interested in that now, all of these young kids may not have Social Security, or their parents may not be prepared for Social Security, and they're going to have to take care of them. And I'm sure at the age most of these are, they're not thinking about taking care of their parents at this age, but um, you get to an age where you do have to take care of them, and they're not going to have that money coming in um, if it indeed gets cut. And that goes to caregivers, too, which I could get into another question, yeah. but we okay. won't. We'll just stay with Social Security right now. All what right. are we going to do about it? Well, i got two easy answers for you. And I, I don't know about all of you, I, I think we have an absence of common sense right now in our government, in our country, around the world. Social Security is the single most effective anti-poverty program in human history. In human history, not just American history. I believe, and it's not an entitlement. Everybody in this room is paying into it. It is a benefit of being a, an American, plain and simple. And as a result, not only do we have to protect it, if anything, we should ensure that it works for everybody who has earned it. And it's not. To your point, in 2033, 2034, there will probably be a 25% cut, roughly, in benefits. Now, it's interesting because a lot of my conservative friends in Congress actually don't want to do anything right now because they know there will be a cut in 2033, so let's just ignore it. And my Democratic colleagues, when I signed up to work with Mitt Romney to actually ensure that the trust funds supporting it are solvent, I got heat from my Democratic friends saying that I'm trying to undermine Social Security. And I said, my friends, you've got to understand it's going to be undermined if we do nothing. And that's the truth. You pointed out the truth, so, so thank you. How do we fix it? Really simply. Right now, the cap, I think, is about $160,000 a year, the contribution cap, which means it is a very regressive tax. If you're earning $160,000 a year, you are paying a lot more of your income into Social Security than someone earning $250,000 a year. So my proposition is very simple. The cap should be raised to $250,000 a year. It'll make Social Security totally solvent until at least the late 2040s. 
And then here's my other proposition. I like to complement what we can do at the government level uh, with also something that kind of combines philanthropy with our needs. And here's a very simple proposition. Why do we not create a mechanism by which all of the Americans who are financially secure upon their retirement, who are in a position to electively contribute their Social Security back into a pool, why not allow them to do so? Very simply, it doesn't cost a dime. All it does is use the federal government to inspire philanthropy, contribute your resources back to the pool, and that pool will redistribute them to the lowest 10% of senior citizens who are literally living on their Social Security, which right now does not even cover cost of living, as you all know. And that is a lot of people in this country. You know, we, have a, we have diseases of despair. We have people who are lonely. At the very least, for goodness sakes, in the United States of America, can we not take care of people who have come before us, like most great cultures in the world do? That's my proposition. The most amazing thing is it's so simple. It is so simple. And that's why I want to become president, for all of you, to bring common sense to a place that we need it. And the second proposition doesn't cost a dime. It just takes a little bit of thinking and reimagining. I want to relieve, I want to repair, and I want to reimagine. That's how we do it. You can clap. I mean, I'm not, you know, we're not used to it in this line of work, so it's kind of nice once in a while. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Oh, I actually, I, I did say this. Well, well, can I come to you next? You're so patient. I'll come to you next. Okay. Oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry. Welcome, to Keith. I'm a, uh, I'm a Vietnam and a Cold War veteran. Oh, thank um, you, sir. Many of my colleagues, um, especially with the uh, cost of housing, mm -hmm. are finding themselves homeless now. So we have a lot of veterans on the streets. And obviously, you have ties to a Vietnam veteran. As president, how would you handle the situation with homeless veterans? And how would you handle it as far as the VA? Thank you. Well, first of all, welcome home. And I mean that sincerely, because the disrespect with which our veterans uh, were treated when they came home from Vietnam is uh, a stain on this country and continues. It's, it's shameful. First of all, it's shameful that 500,000 Americans are going to be sleeping outside tonight. 500,000 Americans will be sleeping outside tonight, including many right here in New Hampshire. The fact that any veteran is sleeping outside in America right now is such a symptom of a bigger disease, which is a country that spends almost a trillion dollars a year preparing and sending young men and women off to war, and then somehow struggling to find the resources to take care of them when they come home, it's appalling. So as, the, as a Gold Star son, as a son of a man who gave his life in Vietnam, believe me, this is really near and dear to my heart, and it's a very simple answer, actually. We need to build 7 million units of housing in the United States. This is the United States of America. The fact that anybody is homeless is absurd. The fact that a veteran, a single veteran, is homeless is ridiculous. And all we need to do is construct housing. It doesn't, we've got plenty of resources. It takes some will. And it takes some reformation, frankly, of our zoning and some of our local codes. Because a lot of the people that recognize we need to fix homelessness, they actually come out and protest in favor of building more housing, are sometimes the same communities that actually will not allow it because of their zoning. So this takes an all-hand-on-deck approach. It takes some capital, which is available. And I tell you, in a market economy like ours, when there's a need, believe me, the private sector will fill it if they can. And it's as simple as that. And that's going to be one of my first missions as president, an all-hands-on-deck mission to build 7 million units of housing all around the country, in rural America, which is in desperate need too, that has terrible housing stock in many cases, which have been ignored for generations, in suburban America and in urban America. It is that simple. It is that simple. And it takes an all-hands-on-deck approach. It is not red or blue. It's a, umer a uniquely American challenge that we can meet. Yeah, sir. Cool. Um, so, everything you've mentioned, as I'm sure you know, um, nothing in life is free, and all of that does sound kind of expensive, and Americans are pretty famous for not liking taxes. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking that you might need to be, be a bit more creative with how you come up with your funding. Sure. So, one specific question I have, I have for you is, how do you feel about the creation of a sovereign wealth fund for the United States? And otherwise, do you just have any other creative ideas as how you're going to come up with money or going to better balance budgets? <laughs> come up with money. <laughs> are you no, gonna, I can tell you every president in recent taxes? memory has come up with ways to... Because it, yeah. it's, easy to, it's yeah. easy to say, like, oh, I'll increase taxes yeah. on the rich or I'll do X, yeah. Y, Z, but how are you actually going to go about it? I'm so glad you asked. Uh, first of all, you know, Alaska is an example of a state in the United States that essentially has a sovereign wealth fund. You know, they use... They, you, you, you agree, right? 
I can't wait to. <laughs> By the way, this is why I do this. I, I've had two of the finest conversations, and I expect this will be one of them, a couple of the finest conversations I have had since I joined the U.S. Congress have been with students in New Hampshire. And I can tell you about them, and I anticipate this is going to be number three. So Alaska is a great example of a state that has natural resources and uses the, uh, the, 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 uses money that's generated from those resources to share with its population. And by the way, you could call it a, a UBI, a universal basic income. Everybody gets a share, right? It's an interesting notion. And by the way, I think we should be testing notions like that because what this president and certainly president, former President Trump have no clue about right now is what artificial intelligence is going to do to this country, this world, and this economy. And if we don't start thinking about it, anticipating it, planning for it, and creating a bipartisan strategy to address it, we will be managed by it instead of us managing AI. So I think it's certainly worthy of consideration. Big picture, we have $33 trillion in debt. We are now spending $2 trillion a year, more than we generate in revenue, and our debt service, our debt service, which is just the interest we pay on that debt, is going to go from the $400 billion range to around the $800 billion range. It's appalling. By the way, credit card debt, consumer credit card debt in the country has now surpassed $1 trillion, and the average interest rate on that is almost 28%. When, when people are screaming that life is unaffordable, and it is so clear why and how we can fix it, and nobody in Washington is willing to address it, and said they say everything is good, the GDP growth is up, and wage growth is up, and people are like, are you freaking kidding me? That's why we've got to have a conversation. Donald Trump added $7 trillion in debt to our federal register. Joe Biden will probably be on track to do the same thing. There is no penalty for it anymore. Every baby born in the United States right now, I believe, is given a $100,000 bill in the crib. Think about that. So to answer your question, is this going to be easy? Absolutely not. Is it going to be fun to walk into the White House knowing that there's a $33 trillion bill on your desk in which you've got to pay $800 billion a year in interest? which is all paying for the past, leaving almost nothing to pay for the future? No, it's not going to be real fun at all. But I've got to tell you, someone's got to tell the darn truth, finally. And someone's got to say the quiet part out loud that something has to change. How? We've got almost a trillion dollar military budget right now. More than the next eight nations or so combined. And we have people sleeping outside. You know, we have 60-some percent of total bankruptcies in the United States are because of medical debt, for gosh sakes. People can't afford their college education, $1.7 trillion in loans. We have kids play, and their parents and grandparents paying more on that debt than they are for their car loans. It's just nauseating. Should we be a country that might reassess how much we spend on bullets and bombs and maybe, maybe a little less to begin with and start allocating it to take care of people right here? Yes, we should. The other programs are really important, Social Security, Medicare. That's what consumes most of our budget right now. So what's the answer? The answer is, when you were in a country in which 30-some percent of the entire wealth is in the hands of just 1% of the American population, in universities, where 320, I think, $5 billion of the total $800 billion in total endowment wealth is held by just 15 universities, we got a problem, and nobody wants to talk about it. So the answer is, those who have been successful, companies, individuals, organizations have got to be bigger contributors to support this country because not a single person in this country creates success alone. Some would like you to believe it, like Donald Trump, by the way, who's declared bankruptcy a number of times, whose philanthropy was shut down because they were corrupt in New York City, and he's under indictment and still leading the current president of the United States in almost every single poll. That's what we're facing right now. He is going to add more debt and destroy the country. Joe Biden will add more debt and not care about it. So I think it's time we actually get real. And that's why I'm not very popular amongst my friends in Washington, because I'm simply telling you the truth. And that's how we're going to have to address it. And we, it's not going to be easy. And the things I'm talking about, I think we should be taxing the, I think it's, I call it the IV endowment excise tax. I eat. <laughs> because the fact of the matter is the same problem with endowments as supporting just a handful of the students in the nation when you've got millions who just need, not a handout, just a hand up. Same is true with wealth and income. If it's not going to be Donald Trump that destroys this country, it is going to be wealth and income inequities. Mark my words. So I think your proposition is great. I would love to get your name and visit after this because I'd love to hear your ideas. And I've not heard a single educated person in Washington ask the question you just did today. So thank you.
And I mean it, so let's talk after. <laughs> I, won't, I won't miss you, and I'm the only one in a suit and tie. <laughs> Hello, sir. So you mentioned that your daughter is gay, correct? Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. So I would imagine that you support her in her, um, the way she is, correct? Absolutely. So my question is, you know, Joe Biden has said that he also supports queer people, and he's doing nothing as we backslide into 1944. So, you know, you, you say that you support um, queer people, and that's great, but do you truly understand what is at stake? We are on the brink of genocide. So the answer, first of all, is of course I don't understand, because I've never walked in my daughter's shoes or your shoes, and of course not. But that's why I'm here. I'm empathetic. So if, I could, if you could hand the microphone back, please tell me what you mean by that so I do understand. And I'll either respond or I will just accept it and, um, and act on it. So, so to be completely um, transparent, I'm not a um, sociology major or political science, but I've done, um, you know, over the course of the past year and a half, I've looked into the current events and a bit of history. And if you look at the lead up to the Nazi, um, Nazi party taking over, um, Looking at the Weimar Republic, it mirrors what we're seeing today very, um, very closely to a um, degree that's terrifying. Um, you know, in Florida, they're burning books, banning everything. Uh, not literally burning books, and as far as I'm aware. But you have the day, don't say gay bill, ha countless over hundreds of um, anti-queer legislation being passed or proposed around the country. Um, just you know, if. You know, a Republican wins in 2024. You know, as you've mentioned, there might not be democracy left. So it was glad to hear um, somebody acknowledge that, um, uh, who actually is an official. But you know, are like, what do you plan on doing to protect queer people? Is my question. As much as humanly possible. And you know, look at leadership. To me, starts with courage. My campaign is a campaign of courage. The word courage, literally, the root of it is la cour, the heart. And if we don't start leading this country with that, it's not about being a strong man or strong woman, right? It's not about, it's about not military might. It's about leading with courage. The courage to say what's true, the courage to be empathetic, and the courage to recognize what's at stake. And the answer is absolutely 100%, but not just because my daughter's gay, because it's the right thing to do. I don't understand how we live in the United States of America in the 21st century and we are still fighting these battles. If anything, we might be regressing in some places. And believe me, members of the Muslim community, the Jewish community right now, suffering mightily. Members of the LGBTQ plus community suffering mightily, fray, afraid. Look, I'm doing this for that reason. Promises are cheap, I totally understand that. And every politician that, come, that comes through this campus and through this state and sits here and makes promises every day about what I'm going to do, you all know the truth. A president can't do anything unilaterally in the United States, thank goodness. He or she needs the U.S. Congress to initiate it. The job of the president is to execute the laws. So let me start with that. We have good civil rights and human rights laws on the books in America. I don't think they're being executed very well sometimes. I don't think they're, I don't think the full force of the American law, the full force of the judiciary, of the judici I'm sorry, the, of our Department of Justice is being used. And I don't understand why fellow Americans, I mean, to me, real patriots, real patriotism means you take care of your fellow American. No matter what he or she thinks, no matter how he or she prays, how he or she eats or lives or whatever they want to call themselves for God's sakes, whatever their gender is or their pronouns. He, she, they. So that's why I'm appalled. And I can only make the promise to you, and you can only have faith in me. And it's not just because of my daughter, Pia. It's because it's the right thing to do. And my life story has been illuminated, constantly illuminated, with looking out for the underdog. And lo and behold, I find myself in that position right now. And I mean that. I've lived a life of privilege and blessing. And now I find myself actually having to fight with people and for people that are being ignored by wide swaths of our leadership right in Washington, D.C. And that's my promise to you. Hold me to it. Hold me accountable. Mark my words, record these words, take a picture, and remember this day. And I will tell you, as the second most bipartisan member of the entire U.S. Congress, I have connections to the people we will need to work with to actually do these things. 
in a way that has never been done before. And I promise you that. That's the only promise I can make. I cannot promise you I can wave a magic wand, but I can promise you that, and I mean it. Hi, uh, Hi. Thank you for coming to Kent State College. I'm Kaylee, and, and I teach a marketing class here. And uh, as business professor, can I ask you one question? You can ask me. Any, <laughs> you can ask me anything. Okay. So uh, obviously, the, the, for the first stage of your competition, your biggest competitor is President Biden, right? The, you had, if you want to, uh, to be, yeah, to be the nom uh, nominee for the Democratic Party, you have to beat President Biden. So my question for you is, uh, how do you differentiate yourself? Mm -hmm. Sure. from uh, yeah, President Biden for the voter to see that uh, yeah. you are a better um, candidate. So for, yeah. let, let me clarify this. My first task is not to beat President Biden. My first task is to beat the system that favors coronations instead of competitions. Give me a stage, right? Put me on the ballot and let me get to work. But if I can't actually get on a ballot in the United States of America as a sitting member of Congress, as a, the, a former member of House leadership, as the ranking member of the Middle East, North Africa, Central Asia subcommittee, I, then we got big problems, my friends. It's just that simple. And that's what Florida has done uh, unilaterally. My first task is to beat this system. It is corrupt. It is disenfranchising. It is suppressing voters, candidates, and debate. And I can clarify that, but I think you know exactly what I'm talking about because it's all in the public domain. No debates. Let's make it hard to get on the ballots by spending millions of dollars, having huge legal teams, and multiple people on my campaign staff dedicated just to the simple act in a democracy of being on a ballot. And then you've got voters. Suppressing voters in Florida, suppressing voters here. That's what I'm taking on. I think Joe Biden is a good man. I can tell you beautiful stories about him, not to mention his accomplishments and the ones I voted for. That's a great thing and it's a good start, but it's time to move to the future. The problems we are facing cannot and will not be addressed by either Joe Biden or Donald Trump. They don't have the capacity, they don't have the lifespan, they don't have the tools, and I don't think they have the intention. That's what I'm trying to take on. I don't want to beat anybody. I do want to beat a system that will not allow thoughtful people to run for office and have their names and their stages open up to make their case. If we stifle that and we suppress that, we are in deep trouble. And all you have to look at is these numbers. Seventy percent of the country does not want either of them, and yet there are people sitting in offices in Washington right now who are making those decisions for us. Seventy percent of Americans do not want either person, and they're the likely ones to be on the ballot. So, differentiating myself from him. Well, there's the obvious, and there's the not so obvious. I'm a Democrat, I'm a proud Democrat. I believe in justice, and I believe in fairness, and I believe in supporting the underdog. That makes me very similar to Joe Biden. But he has been in Washington for 50 years, since I was three years old. He's been trying to tackle these problems for these times. But why then do we have this homelessness problem? Why do we have seven million housing units deficient? Why do we not have a health care system that works? Right? Why do we have to endure a system that has $1.7 trillion in college debt floating out there that requires many of you and your families to pay $85 billion a year? Why is life unaffordable when you've been there 50 years? I think that's the problem. We have people who are a product of this culture where they have no domain outside of Washington, where they're so encapsulated, where they spend all their times with people of just great means, that they believe that they understand what's really going on. I'm listening. That's the biggest difference. I'm listening. And you know what? Donald Trump is listening. He is a horrifying man. I have great animus towards him. I was in the House chamber on January 6th. Do not get me wrong. He is dangerous. I do not have animus towards the people that support him that are screaming out loud, many of whom voted for Barack Obama twice. They're not deplorable. They're not despicable. Frankly, there are some Americans that are both, on both sides. I'll say that out loud. But this notion of using condemnation and not invitation at the highest levels of government is I'm, I'm sick of it. 
He has tried. He's had plenty of time, 50 years, eight years as vice president, three years as president. It's time to pass the torch. That's the biggest difference. And the last thing is affordability, 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 and peace. We need peace at home. We need peace abroad. We need affordability for Americans, and it's damn high time we start taking care of people here first. That does not mean we ignore our responsibilities around the world. That does not mean we ignore our responsibility to ensure we have the best national defense in the entire world and the most prepared military. But it's like public education. We should be taking care of our public schools first, first, and then afford opportunities to make choices wherever you want to send your kids. We should ensure every American has health coverage first, and then let people make choices of how they want to do anything that's amplified. We should make sure everyone has a house first, everybody, and then let people have the freedom to choose where they want to live, right? Why do we not do that first? That's the biggest difference. He's had 50 years. And it is not just time, it is past time to make a change. That's the biggest difference. If I'm allowed to make my case, I guarantee you I will be ahead of Donald Trump next May. And I suspect that Joe Biden will be even further behind because everybody recognizes what's going on. And I believe all of you, too. Oh, yeah. I think right here in the, in the back, sir. Yeah. Oh, oh, there's another guy in the back. Oh, after you, after, yeah, you'll be next, sir. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hey, um, so I like to consider myself somewhat of an environmentalist, and it seems like you claimed that uh, as president you would like to create six million additional houses, which sounds great. It would be awesome if everyone had a house. Yeah. But obviously that would come with some serious environmental concerns like deforestation, some use of like some uh, unclean energy. Uh, in general, I was just curious as to how you would treat this environmental crisis that's going on in the world, and especially New England, and how the housing project would uh, fall under that category. That's a great question. So when, when I say I'm creating six million, million homes, it's six million housing units. Seven million is what we need. Six and a half million is what the deficiency is. I believe we, would, we should build a little bit more. And the reason I say a little bit more is that's how you put downward pressure in a market economy on pricing. When there's a little bit more supply than demand, prices will drop. When there's a little bit more demand than supply, prices rise. That's why we have a grocery price crisis. That's why we have fuel spikes all the time. Uh, and that's why we have a housing spike. And that's, frankly, the same issue with education. So to answer your question very directly, we can build housing in a much more environmentally sustainable way. We do not have to use wood. There are some extraordinary experiments going on around the world in, in building shelters, especially in sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the world where resources are literally not available. There's almost no money, and they're finding ways to use new materials and new ways to construct. By the way, human, through human history. It wasn't, that, it wasn't that long ago when humans started using wood to build structures. They used to use mud. Right? We can build sustainable housing in the United States of America. We can. And by the way, that's not just building houses. That's building multi-unit, high-density developments near transit so people can get to their work. That means I think we should create new communities to demonstrate how a 21st and 22nd community should be constructed, where you, where you give incentives to walk, where you create public spaces and gatherings places, where you actually attack America's problems because of its physical design in a way that we can actually solve the problems by simply giving people incentives. Dan Buettner, who's the Blue Zones creator, he's already doing this with cities around the country. He is changing health outcomes by simply modestly redesigning cities so they become more walkable to make sure people have good food to eat. They don't live in food deserts, right? The 15-minute city, if you will. Imagine if we all lived in a, a village, a town, or a city where within 15 minutes we could walk to get every necessity we needed. These are the kinds of things we should be thinking about. We have office vacancies because of the transition right after COVID, that we should be converting every single office building that will be sitting empty soon into new housing units. We should be using hotels that are closed. We should use that right away. Of course, some of them are already doing it. And we should use materials that are renewable and sustainable. We should be rehabbing. And the point of the matter is, at the end of the day, this does become a fundamental question. Are we going to take care of people who are alive? Are we going to take care of people who are alive? And you know, I think the answer should be yes. 
And that means we have to be responsible stewards of the resources for the future to ensure they exist. But we are now not taking care of people who are alive. And yes, we've got to make tough choices. I know that. And that means things like uh, electric cars. Well, you know what? The environmental, impa environmental impact of making electric cars is real. I'm telling you the truth. If you want to give up your cell phones and your iPhones and your laptops and your automobiles because you don't want to do any mining, that's a choice we've got to make. Speak in the quiet part out loud. Uh, I love your ideas on it, by the way. And if any of you who care about this, bring these ideas to my attention so we don't work and live in silos, that so you can actually give me ideas that I can you know, share and hopefully actually utilize when I'm president. Because I know there are great thinkers out there, but they have the same problem I'm having right now. How do you get your idea in front of people? If it's not clickbait, if it's not divisive, if it's not stupid and mean, it's really hard right now to get people to recognize really good work. So let's have the courage to change it. I'd love to hear from you about it. I, I just had a statement and I had a question following, but I think you and Marianne Williamson ought to get together and have your own debate by the airtime in New Hampshire here somehow and invite Biden. He might come, put an empty chair there if he doesn't. Believe me, we've talked. Well, good. I hope that happens. I really do. Uh, my Thank question you. is about the Middle East, though. You yeah. mentioned you're on that committee. Yes. What do you see the answer is there? Is it going to be to put screws on Netanyahu to, to calm it down, or what? I'll just mm -hmm. need you to answer. It's a great, great question. Let, let me start with your first one, which is debate. I, I, I don't understand how we live in the United States of America, and it is even possible that a front runner for the Republicans and the front runner for Democrats could or even would refuse to debate. I, it, is the, it is the first responsibility of American leadership to debate. I just want to make that darn clear, because I'm shocked. I am shocked and dismayed that the President of the United States is saying he will not debate. And I'm shocked and dismayed that the former President of the United States is saying he will not debate. I'll say it again. The current and former President of the United States of America will not debate their competitors in their primaries. It's just wrong, and it's frickin' dangerous, and I'm sick of it. With that said, I'm feeling the same way about the Middle East. I'm a 54-year-old Jewish man who grew up supporting the State of Israel for two reasons, because there is only one Jewish majority nation in the entire world, and after the Holocaust, after six million people who are just of the Jewish faith were killed, by the way, many, many more than that, but six million people who just happened to be Jewish were killed. Babies and moms and dads and grandpas and grandparents. It's horrifying. And the only place they thought they could go then is here. And some of them got on boats immediately and they came over to the United States. And you know what happened? They were turned around. So anyone who tells me that the United States is always open, no, we're not. The shining city on the hill, the United States of America, often turns away people who are literally at the end of their rope and end of their lives if we do not accept them. Why do you think people make arduous journeys with their babies across the Rio Grande River? They're not here to hurt us, they're here to help us because they want to become Americans. The same is true of the Jews who left is fleeing death and they were turned around. Many of them died. So Israel needs to exist. I'm going to start with that. And it is not anti-Semitic to criticize the Israeli government when they are misbehaving. I'm a Jewish man who aspires to be the president of the United States who will sign documents to create a Palestinian state. And I cannot wait to do so because it needs to happen. It's long overdue. And I have met with Netanyahu twice this year. I've looked him in the eye. I've told him these words about what he is doing. By the way, not just to the state of Israel, but to the Jewish diaspora, including me and my kids and all of you who might be Jewish in this room. And by the way, the same pain being felt by the Muslim community. Three young boys shot in Burlington, of all places. Come on. For no reason other than it looks like they were of Palestinian descent. You know, I, I don't know what all you think. I'd like to imagine that you would place humanity above religion and above race and above nationality. So why don't we do it? What is this nonsense? Why is this such a binary world where you have to take one side or the other? Why can't we take the human side? Democrats and Republicans, Palestinians and Israelis, let's take the human side. That's what I have to say, sir. 
So, and so, so that's what I'm saying. So now I want to tell you about how we do this. Hamas, Netanyahu is out of line. His settlement policy is bad. His government is not one that I want to see lead the state of Israel. And for, by the way, I don't think most Israelis do either. Israel is also the most progressive nation in the Middle East. It's the only democracy. It's where two million Muslims live with protections and security. It is where LGBTQ plus community can actually not just survive but thrive, as Richie Torres, my wonderful colleague from New York, will tell you. Hamas is the enemy of Israel. They're the enemy of Palestinians. They do not want to see peace. Iranian proxies, Hamas and Hezbollah, they knew how close the Saudis were to normalizing with Israel. I was part of that. I've been to Riyadh, Jerusalem, to Turkey. We were this close, and they didn't want to see peace because that would be a problem for the Iranian regime. Hamas doesn't want to see peace. Hamas wants to destroy Jews and Israel. The Palestinian Authority pays people who would so much as kill a Jew. It's called pay to slay. These are truths. They're corrupt. We need new leadership in the West Bank, and we need new leadership in the West Wing. West Bank and West Wing, because Joe Biden has been doing this for 50 years, since I was a baby. And has anything changed? By the way, I believe in results. You can be a wonderful human being, have a great heart, be empathetic, have a beautiful life story, be in Washington 50 years, but has anything changed? No. Mahmoud Abbas is in his late 80s. Has anything changed? No. Benjamin Netanyahu, 30 years. Has anything changed? No. It's time for a new generation of leaders. That's what I believe. Release the hostages, a ceasefire immediately, withdraw from Gaza, a multinational force to provide security, not to include Israel or the United States, then a multinational task force to eliminate Hamas. Because Hamas is holding nine Americans right now for two months, and the President of the United States should be facing our country every single day talking about it. It is the first responsibility of the American President to get our hostages released using every single lever of influence, kinetic, diplomatic, and otherwise, to get it done. That's how I feel, and I'm sick of it, if you can't tell. And if you think the same people, yeah. Sick of it. Sick of it. Yeah. Um, oh, we'll get a microphone for you. Uh, In the meantime, I'm going to get a sip of water. Uh, this isn't uh, something I think people talk about a ton, but I think it's something that should be addressed. Is um, I think people should have more awareness about like um, disability. Uh, I have uh, Asperger's Syndrome, and I personally feel grateful I was always getting support from my family and got good services for the school, but there are a lot of people with like my profile who don't get nearly half the services that I was able to get, and there are plenty of people on the spectrum who fall off a cliff once they uh, age out of services and are never able to like launch properly, and I feel like... Uh, there should be better um, supports for Americans with disabilities. And also, um, in general, like during my middle and high school years, uh, I, think I experienced some bullying about my uh, Asperger's, and I don't think it was just like, um, like immature teenager bullying. I think it was actual ableism, which I think ableism has been charged like because of like Donald Trump because I don't know if you remember like uh, he mocked a disabled reporter and his supporters all followed in Trump's footsteps and there's been a high level of like ableism on like social media and in general and I feel like there should be something to protect people with disabilities from ableists and uh, better services to help Americans that have like disabilities or are on the spectrum so they can all be at their full potential like I'm someone with uh, on the autism spectrum and I feel like everyone on the spectrum deserves a chance here here what, what is your name Liam Liam I first of all I love you and second of all you are the most courageous person I've seen today Aww. I mean it I love you. and I gotta tell you you know <laughs> I've had so many great experiences in New Hampshire. And the most profound is this. And when I met a young person at the Laconia Pumpkin Festival, and I go up to people regularly and I say, if you had a magic wand and you could do anything you want, you could wave it, what would you do? The majority of young people who I ask that question of tell me I wish people would be more friendly. And that's not something a president can do. 
I know. That's not something a Congress can legislate. That's why this is a campaign of courage. For you, because you are the courageous. The bullies are the weaklings. Donald Trump is a weakling. The young person I saw at the Laconia Pumpkin Festival, one of the most courageous young people I've ever met in my life, right up there with you, because you are the awesome people. You are the people that I want to have in the White House. You are the people who should populate my youth cabinet, because ableism is relative. I work with some of the most disabled people in the entire world. I mean it. Their emotional capacities are disabled. Their integrity is disabled. George Santos finally just left the House. We have, we have Senator Menendez still walking the halls of the Senate, protected by Democrats. So back to your point, thank you. Because there's nothing I can say that you didn't, couldn't say better and just did. And I mean it. That's exactly what this campaign is about. To recognize, celebrate, and appreciate really courageous Americans, most of whom are not residing in Washington, D.C. They are residing right here and all around the country doing it every single day, and I think you are extraordinary. Thank you so much. Thank you, Liam. I mean it. Yeah. I to say <laughs> Should um, we do the horror? I mean, <laughs> um, we, are, we go to the same synagogue in Minneapolis, oh, Temple Israel. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to ask what your plan for gun violence is especially within um, urban areas yeah. that have been um, systematically oppressed by the government mm. and don't often get as much airtime as white schools that are shot sure. up. Yeah, that's enough. What is your name? I'm Aaron. Aaron, great to see you. The synagogue that we both attend is one where I had my bar mitzvah, uh, been married, have where my father had his funeral. I mean, it's a very special place to me. Uh, so nice to make that connection. I'm so glad that you started by saying, what are we going to do about gun violence? Because most Democrats say, what are we going to do about gun control? And if you want to end a conversation about the objective, that's the best way to start the conversation. Talk about control, which does not work in the United States of America. Uh, I'm a firearm owner. And I don't know a fellow firearm owner who wants to see their kids slaughtered in schools or in nightclubs or in grocery stores or at music festivals. Not a one. They just see the solution a little bit differently, sometimes a lot differently than a lot of us. And to answer your question really directly, I'll start with this. Um, let's start with the data. And to your point, mass murders are what make us so afraid because they seem so random that it could subject any of us to it. But if it happens in someone else's neighborhood, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Or if they don't look like me, you know, eh, it's probably not such a big deal. But the second it goes on in a grocery store that you go to, whoa, suddenly we act. That's the American problem right now. We don't act until it's in our backyard. Whether it's climate change, whether it's the southern border, whether it's gun violence. So what do we do? Data. The best research actually is two Minnesotans, Dr. Jillian Peterson and James Densley, the, the Violence Project. Mm -hmm. I encourage any of you who care about gun violence to take a look. They should be the most celebrated policy proponents in the world right now, or in the country, because the rest of the world doesn't have this problem. They have two simple solutions. They say that, first, if you reduce suicide, you will reduce gun violence, mass violence, but by definition, I don't know what the number is, but tens, I think 10,000 suicides by gun in the United States annually. If we want to reduce episodic gun violence, we reduce suicide. Well, how do you do that in a country that has no mental or emotional health care system, right? makes it impossible to find counseling, and if you do, it's usually months down the road. We build a system. The most prestigious, prosperous country in world history does not have an emotional mental health care system. So that's how we start. We reduce suicides. By the way, veterans, 30,000 American veterans have killed themselves, taken their own lives since Iraq and Afghanistan, where we lost 3,000 of them. 30,000 every day because we don't have an emotional and emo uh, mental health care system. So that's one. Secondly, they say, you know what? 80-some percent of these monsters either explicitly or implicitly tell people what they're going to do, either through social media or they tell their friends. What happened in Maine and Lewiston? The man was screaming about his intentions for a long time. If they had a red flag law, it would have been prevented. And I believe in, in, in due process. I don't think we should be seizing anything from people unless there is a good reason and they should have recourse to get it back. So that's another. Red flag laws. 
and someone is in distress, they should not be able to access a firearm. And first of all, we should not let people acquire a firearm. That's why we need universal background checks. In the 1930s, we banned automatic weapons. In the late 60s, we further tightened restrictions. Don't tell me the Constitution doesn't afford for some restrictions. You know our founders would never have tolerated this. They would have been ashamed. And this is coming from a gun owner, for goodness sakes. So that's how we start. I voted for the assault weapons ban because it worked. The data indicated we did not have that degree of mass shootings when it was in place. Why do we in America allow an 18-year-old who cannot even buy a beer for three more years to carry a semi-automatic long gun with a, with, with a magazine capacity that can cause mass human casualties in a matter of moments? Does that not sound bizarre? That's where we're at. Why? Why? Because for 50 years, we've had people like Joe Biden in Washington. 50 years, we've had the NRA enriching the pockets of politicians who know better. The same quiet conversations, my friends, are had all the time. They don't want to vote for any, any gun legislation because they don't want to put themselves at risk. They don't want to lose their jobs back home in their deep red districts. I mean, that's the nonsense that's going on right now, everybody. We need just a little bit of common sense, for goodness sakes. And that's what I intend to bring. That's a start. Is it everything? No. Because the fact of the matter is, the easy access to guns is going to make this happen time and time and year after year again. But we can do better, and we must, and that's how we do it. Common sense. And we just have time for two more questions. Two more questions. Uh, oh. Am I? Haley? Oh, yeah. yeah. OK. And then, Hi again. Yeah. Oh. All right. Hi again. Um, a lot of your ideas are great. It would be great if these things happened. Um, but we know that it's hard to get people to collaborate in Congress. It's hard to see people unified. Joe Biden said similar things about unification. Other people who ran in the 2020 election, again, similar things about unification. But also, as you said, division is what the media sells. So how are you going to overcome that? How are you actually going to get people to become unified? Yeah, he talked about it. Talk is frickin' cheap, and I've seen enough of it. And I mean that with all due respect to those who actually dream about these things and really don't have an intention of doing it. There's a big difference between talking and doing. I'm the only person running for president of the United States of America right now that can give you proof points of how I work with others. You don't become the second most bipartisan member of the entire House, Senate, and all 50 governors, 585 people. Number two, you don't become number two if you do not work with other people. And I'm a progressive. I work very closely with my Republican colleagues. I passed my first bill during COVID, the Paycheck Protection Program Flexibility Act, which saved thousands of businesses and thousands more jobs by working with probably the 433rd most bipartisan member of Congress, a guy by the name of Chip Roy. Do you know who Chip Roy is? Those of you who follow politics, he's pretty conservative, Freedom Caucus member, the guy that's on TV a lot right now, you know, gumming up the system. You know what? Chip and I are friends. Do we see things the same way? My goodness, no. But I'll tell you, when our principles intersect, we got something done. That's how I operate. Joe Biden has not been in the Senate, in the legislative body, for many, many, many years. He said he would restore the soul of the country. Is there any evidence that that soul has even been restored by just a modicum? No. I'm a results person. I think it's time for change. Joe, I mean, you know that Donald Trump is, has no intention of doing that. My intention is to invite people who support Donald Trump to join this, because actually I feel the same way about the system that is holding people down. So I will do it differently. And how? In the White House, I will have a bipartisan cabinet, the same way that Abraham Lincoln, when the country was literally being pulled apart at the seams, he said, this is a time for a team of rivals. Is it as comfortable as he would have wanted? Absolutely not. But he knew if he did not have the views of everybody who was pulling the country apart at the same table, there was no chance whatsoever. That's what I'll do. I won't make political appointments. I will make appointments based on the best and brightest. No matter your politics, if you're a person of principle, I will have you at that table. I don't want to appoint ambassadors who just enrich my campaign like every single president does right now. Do you know that? Do you know that a bunch of our ambassadors, especially the most prominent, cushy positions, are the ones that contribute the most to presidential campaigns? Do you know that? It's appalling. You know what it says to those who literally spend their entire years climbing the ranks of our foreign service, the dedicated public servants who have really put time into this, what does it say to them? 
If you have money, you can become an ambassador. It's nonsense. This is how we got to do things. I'll have a youth council, a youth cabinet, all, all 50 states. Liam, you might be part of it. I want to have someone from every single state representing every political perspective, every race, religion, background, geography, because that's how you start bringing a country back together. I will have common ground dinners in the White House. What I do, well, I'm going to tell you a story. My closing story of every event I do, I'm going to tell you at the end. I'm going to save it. You'll see how I will lead as president. And all I'm saying is give me four years. Give me four years. We survived Trump, barely. Rest assured, not only will we survive, we're going to do so much better if we just have the courage to make a change. That's the why. And I promise you, you're going to see a Democrat who says things that are true that might actually offend Democrats. Because it's time that we recognize that not one side or the other has all the answers and see th sees things exactly correct. If we did, we would be living in a dictatorship is the truth. We live in a country that's roughly split 50-50. And if one side thinks it can beat its way to, the, to victory, and that we're going to overcome the division by winning, no, we've got to stop fighting each other and start fighting for each other, period. All right, last question, and then I'm going to wrap it up. Yeah. Hi, thank you for coming. Yeah, what's um, your name? Joe. Hey, Joe. Pleasure to meet you. Um, before I get into it, I want to say thank you to your father. And thank you to you for serving in Vietnam. My grandfather also served in Vietnam. Oh, well, thank you. So. What, was, what is his name or was his name? Uh, Merle. Mm. Um, he just he recently passed away. Uh, I'm thinking of you too. Thank, thank you, you for his sacrifices and for thinking. I'll think of him. Thank you. Um, as a as a conservative, you could probably guess that I have a ton of questions. Please, and I love it. I only yeah. ask one because I know there's a time restraint. Yeah. But um, you said that you wanted to ban um, automatic weapons and um, semi weapons. But um, a majority of the, the murders in this country are pri primary, primarily with uh, handguns, especially ghost guns, yeah. that don't have VINs. So would you eventually make a case to ban all guns? No. Oh, uh, let me ask, because I, I, I want to answer that, uh, but that'll be an easy answer. Do you have one more question? Um, I, I, and I say this sincerely, because this is the example of what we got to do more of. I love my conversations with conservatives, because I learn from them. And I'd like to hear another question, if you have anything on your mind, in addition to what you just asked, and I'll answer it. Yeah, um, one of my, as a conservative, one of my major issues is open borders. Yeah. Um, obviously, we have a huge immigration problem. Um, Mexico is dumping their prisoner and cartel members over the border. Um, it's become a huge problem, um, especially through the border. Like, the, the agents there can't even, like, defend the border. Like, they walk over in multiple cars. It's, it's brutal. And... The New York senators and stuff have replaced the elderly, and they've kicked them out of the elderly homes and replaced them with the illegal immigrants. So I was wondering how, um, if you were president, how you could strengthen our borders. Or, because you said, also said a case that I, I'm a firm believer in immigration. You know, we all came here off a boat. My family um, came here from Italy um, at, with Mussolini. Um, but I, I was wondering if you would support open borders because it sounded like you wanted everyone to come here. And that's obviously that's okay, but would you be willing to do it in a sense where it's legal? Um, yeah. You know what I mean? First of all, thanks for both questions. And let me answer, let me answer the gun one first. What, what I said is I don't want to ban automatic weapons. They are already banned. They were firearms. Uh, the Supreme Court, approved, it was in the late 30s. During gangland era violence, we banned automatic weapons. Now, they're still available. you got to go through a... Re this is what's so interesting. You can buy an automatic weapon in the United States because they, they didn't, like, melt them down. They are still in circulation. But you know how you do it? you got to go through a very significant background check. Very significant background check. So it kind of poses the question a little bit of why do we have to subject ourselves to a very significant background check that is totally constitutional for an automatic weapon but don't have to for a semi-automatic weapon. That basically does the same thing. If you, if you measure it by how many human beings it can kill in a matter of just moments. So like I said, I, the Second Amendment is the Second Amendment, and I, I respect it. I own a firearm. It's not, this is not about taking or banning, and there are a lot of ways to address this. Uh, no, I do not want to take everybody's gun away. I think Fox News would like to have everybody believe in the country that Democrats want to take everyone's guns away. That's not the truth. That's not the truth. I don't. I simply want to reduce deaths. And you're right. Ghost guns, big problem. By the way, we've got a lot of laws on the books right now that are simply unenforceable or not being enforced, in no small part, 
because our law enforcement departments are very devoid of, um, of, of staff. The quality and caliber of applicants right now going down by the day, and we are facing a crisis. So yes, we need to enforce our laws. We need to have a national conversation about what we are willing to tolerate. Uh, and I'm afraid that we, in the absence of that conversation, we're in big, big trouble. And I hear you, because you're right. Most of the gun deaths are actually either suicide or handgun violence. And until they come to your neighborhood, no one wants to do anything about it. And I agree. And I'd like your ideas on this, by the way. As a supporter of the Second Amendment, I want to talk to you after, if we could, spend a few minutes, because I want your ideas. Um, as for your second question, you know, I, I will tell you that as I listen to you, I literally can see, like, Sean Hannity on TV um, saying those words about the border. And I just want to be forthright with you. I don't make decisions about people or issues until I actually go see them for myself. That's true about Donald Trump, and that's true about the southern border. So I went there twice, and I've seen with my own eyes what's going on there. And I will tell you this, and I loved your beautiful words about being a country that welcomes and wants immigrants, and I totally agree. It is, what's going on in the southern border is to me the most embarrassing, reprehensible, and unforgivable thing I've ever seen in the United States of America. I saw human beings and children literally in cages. In cages. I will never forget the sight of seeing human beings, and particularly kids, in cages. I will never forget the sight of babies and strollers who have been abandoned on the border, who are in these facilities whose parents will probably never be known. And it really jarred me. And I thought to myself, how in the 21st century in the United States of America can this be happening? And now I understand, because I've been working in this environment for five years where I see why no administration wants to solve it, because they're all focused on winning election, and if they actually solve the problem, they have nothing to campaign on. And if they actually solve the problem, they'd probably lose their next election, because that's how it works. So here's the solution. Yes, we need secure borders, because it is a national security issue. It absolutely is. And I'm sure you understand that, and probably the rest of you do, too. I serve on the Foreign Affairs Committee. I see intelligence. I know what our adversaries want to do to us, and I know they probably have sent people here already. Probably some came on planes, probably some came on, on ships, and probably some came across the border. I live in a border state in Minnesota. People come across Manitoba, right into Minnesota. Who knows how much, but it happens. Yes, we need border security. We need to completely reimagine our ports of entry because they do not process human beings or uh, commercial trucks nearly as efficiently as we need to. But here's how we stop the problem. Because America only wants to solve things once they are literally almost unsolvable. And once they get to the border, it's almost too late. So what do we do? We use our foreign aid budget first to invest it better in the countries from which migrants are coming. This, the Northern Triangle countries invest in their economies, and safety and security. We know how to do it. And then we should build dormitories near our consulates and embassies and process asylum cases locally. If we just made a simple switch in how asylum cases are treated, rather than forcing people to come across the border, as we do now, spend $7,000 per person to pay the Mexican cartels to bring you across, dump you on the Rio Grande, you walk across, you file for asylum, now you've lost your $7,000, it's in the hand of the Mexican cartel. You are placed on the street, maybe in El Paso, with your child. You cannot work because it's illegal. And then a social service agency has to try to help you out. And then governors of Texas and other places are saying, we cannot handle this because the federal government is not giving us a darn thing to help us with. And then they're putting them on buses to New York City where the cities are saying, help us. That's what's happening. So why wouldn't we... Ask people to file your asylum cases at home. We'll protect you while it's being adjudicated. You will save your money. And if you qualify, we will bring you to the United States. You will have $7,000 in your pocket per person to start your new lives here. You can work, and you can start building your American dream. And if you don't qualify, you will go back to your home, wherever you're coming from, and you'll still have $7,000 in your pocket. And in the meantime, we will help you with safety, security, and economy. I think that's the America that should be, uh, that's the America I aspire to. Because the fact of the matter is Democrats and Republicans are not that far apart on this subject. We're simply being told by an angertainment industry that we are so divided on this subject. And you said it beautifully. I believe in immigration. It should be thoughtful, you know, following laws, and that we can be sure to accommodate people. Because when I see veterans sleeping outside in Veterans Park in Manchester, New Hampshire, and they're not being taken care of, I think it's fair to say we should start taking care of our own, too, and we can do both. That's how I see it. That's how I see it. Yeah.
so, and you know, I, I'll tell you, John Lewis, who I just adored, used to say, you know, we all came over on ships. Some came on a slave ship, some came on the Mayflower, some came on the SS Lawn, like my great-great-grandparents came. But he said, no matter what ship you came on, we are all in the same boat now. And that's such a beautiful truth, because not everybody in this country came at their own will or to find a better life. A lot of people were brought here. But that's why your question, I think, is such an important one, and we got to start having that conversation. So I'm going to end the story here, because a lot of this kind of comes down to what kind of president will you be? And here's what kind of president I will be, illuminated by a story. I believe so deeply from my business career that the best leaders lead with their heart and lead by comprising teams of rivals. The best ideas I've ever heard not didn't come from the CEO suites or the management teams. They came from the shop floors, from the manufacturing lines, from the sales reps, right? And we need a culture that rewards the courage of people who are not in the highest positions of power. That's what I'm used to. And I believe that if you do not repair, and think about the word, to repair America, to get back together, we're going to be all lost. So I do a series at home called Common Ground. Uh, we get six Democrats and six Republicans to sit at a table over lunch, because you've got to break bread if you're going to get people together. And it's facilitated by this amazing group called Braver Angels. If you want to help repair the country, please look at Braver Angels. So we bring people together, we introduce ourselves, uh, we have a little nosh, we tell people about our background, we talk about health care, immigration, and national division. And lo and behold, I have discovered that Democrats and Republicans all hate the health insurance companies. I have discovered that Democrats and Republicans, just like you said, all support the notion of being a nation of immigrants that welcome people. And I've discovered that all Democrats and Republicans with whom I've sat are really afraid of the division. And I thought to myself, holy moly, this is really amazing. This is what we should be doing on a national level. So I had this experience not long ago where at the very end of this session, two hours, we sit and each of us tells the rest of the group what we got out of this experience. So a young woman, Emily, looks across the table at Dave and says, you know, Dave, I got to tell you, when you drove up in your F-150 with the Trump sticker, I almost got back in my car, left the parking lot, and couldn't even bear the notion of coming in, let alone sitting at the table with you. But she said, I got to say, I am so glad I did because you're a really cool guy and I learned a few things today. And I just want to say thanks. And I, that kind of blew me away. Gets the, around the table to Dave and I'm thinking, what is he going to say? Dave looks at Emily and says, Emily, when you drove up in your Prius, I wanted to run it over. And he said, but I got to tell you, I'm glad I didn't because I have never sat with a progressive before. And I'm telling you, I had one of the greatest afternoons of my recent life. And I want to say thank you. And at that moment, the dyed in the wool trumper and the bleeding heart liberal stood up and embraced in front of all of us. And I got to tell you, if that alone, I thought to that, at that moment, if that alone was my only legacy, whether this this journey in public service continues next November or ends that day or even sooner. Let me tell you, that made it all worthwhile because we demonstrated at that moment that Dave and Emily can hug it out, the country can hug it out, and as your president, that's exactly what I will be doing every single day because no matter what policy is important to you, if we don't start hugging it out, we're not going to get anywhere. Thanks, everybody. Love you all. Give it up for the next president of the United States, Dean Phillips. Folks, if you'd like a photo with Dean, line up right over here where I'm raising my hand, and we'll make that happen for you nice and quick. Thanks, folks.